Welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom, the king of all late night, and you're with us on the color cast now for Friday night, the 19th of June, 1998. Laura Linney is here tonight, one of the co-stars of the very popular motion picture called The Truman Show, and my friend and one of our time's great storytellers, Harlan Ellison, and you on the toll-free line. Mother Snyder is fine. I got email about her today. I saw her two days ago. She is just fine, and there's nothing new to report, but with Oliver the dog, it's another story. You know, I've had this dog now for six months, and the only issue I have with this pup is that when he sees another dog walking on the streets, he goes absolutely ballistic, okay? So my trainer gave me what's called a bark collar, which you fit on the dog, and when he barks, he gets a very, very slight jolt of electricity from a flashlight battery that he said will cause the dog to stop barking and pay attention to me rather than the animals the dog sees. So this has all gone well for the first week until this morning at 10.27 a.m. on Whittier Boulevard uh, near Sunset in Beverly Hills, California, when Oliver saw another dog and was airborne for eight seconds. Air Oliver, okay? And I tried to restrain the dog, and he knocked me on my butt, okay? This is 90 pounds of, of uh, raw, naked power I'm dealing with here. So I called the trainer this afternoon, and tomorrow, Oliver doesn't know this yet unless he's watching tonight, but he tomorrow is going to meet the remote-controlled electroshock collar. <laughs> One step closer to the firing squad, huh? But he, uh, I'll tell you, man, he's a, he, you people who train dogs know this. So they are uh, creatures with minds of their own. Anyway, what I thought we'd do tonight is go through some new submissions from 11th, or from, uh, uh, yeah, 11th graders who have uh, answered their science tests uh, with, uh, with these statements of fact as, as seen in their minds. Uh, here's the first one now. Do you understand the premise here? Yeah, science, science responses to a test given to, I don't think it's 11th graders, I think it's 11-year-old kids. Because if these were 11th graders, we have a nation of morons. 11-year-old kids, right. Knowing that a gross moron is 144 times more stupid than a regular moron. <laughs> I've said that before, but I've worn this tie before. Respiration is composed of two acts, first inspiration and then expectoration. The moon is a planet just like the earth, only it is much deader. Artificial insemination is when the farmer does it to the cow instead of the bull. Artificial insemination. Actual answers from 11-year-old kids, science quizzes around the country. The skeleton is what is left after the insides have been taken out and the outsides have been taken off. The purpose of the skeleton is something to hitch meat to. <laughs> hitch meat to. The tides are a fight between the earth and the moon. All water tends towards the moon because there is no water in the moon and nature abhors a vacuum. I forgot where the sun joins in this fight. A fossil is an extinct animal. The older it is, the more extinct it is. <laughs> Many women believe that an alcoholic binge will have no ill effects on the unborn child, but this is a large misconception. Actually, that makes a little bit of sense, doesn't it? Uh, a, a liter is a nest of young puppies. Rhubarb, a kind of celery gone bloodshot. Vacuum, a large empty space where the Pope lives. <laughs> Let me call Les Moonves here. Les, these are pretty good, aren't they, Les? Yeah, yeah. The writers all worked all day today, Les. Yeah. All right, all right. You can't talk to me that way, Les. Bye now. Les says hi. To prevent contraception, wear a condominium. When you breathe, you inspire. When you do not breathe, you expire. When you smell a gas with no odor, it is probably carbon monoxide, except in our studio, yeah. <laughs> and I believe this is the last one. Nitrogen is not found in Ireland because nitrogen is not found in a free state. <laughs> Actual answers from 11-year-old kids on science exams all over the country. Laura Linney is here tonight, one of the co-stars, uh, along with Jim Carrey in The Truman Show, which is now playing in theaters and drive-ins everywhere. And then uh, the world's best storyteller, Harlan Ellison, and you on the toll-free. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS, and thanks for catching our pictures as we fly them through the air. Harlan Ellison's a great storyteller. He's written over 1,700 stories and 74 books. 
He's a man of many facets, many opinions, and many appearances on programs that I've done over the years. And it's a pleasure to welcome him back to CBS. You know, I was thinking driving over here. How long, kiddo, have we been doing this? I was, just, I was thinking that earlier. Uh, we go back to the old Tomorrow Show, but before that, that you did another show that we were on together. In fact, in fact, a friend, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember him, remember Julie Schwartz? Sure. Who was the editor of Superman? Today's sure. his 83rd birthday. You're good. I, I, I promised him I'd say happy birthday One to him. One of the shows that we did back in New York, we had, uh, we had the fellows that created Superman on. Schuster right. You had Siegel and Schuster on. Yeah. And they were getting nothing from the movie. Until, nothing zipped. Until Neil, Adam, until Neil Adams uh, got, them, got them their money. Well, Julie, Julie met Stan Lee on that show. He f remembers that to this day. In fact, I talked to the old man Wednesday. He <laughs> said, say hi to you. Good. Now, not only have you written lots of books, but you have a lot of books in your house, don't you? You have a big library. I have a quarter of a million books in my house, yes. In that little house? What do you mean, little well, house? Well, I mean, from the street, it appears. Well, to be. from the street, it looks little, but it's a, it's a big, beautiful house facing out on 200 acres of watershed land, which we will talk about a little yeah, later. Yeah, But uh, in, in the collection, when did this begin, and, and why so many? Well, I, 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 I'm a kid of the Depression. I couldn't throw anything away. I'm a pack rat. Gotcha. But uh, a book... I would, I would read a book and then I would say later, I said, wait a minute, what was that phrase? And I would know I would need the phrase later. Yeah. So we just kept expanding and expanding. But now we've got rolling stack bookcases. One room holds 40,000 books. And um, it's, 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 real, it's real nice. And you've got comic books in there, don't you? I have a lot of comic books, yeah. I got a lot of comic books. I got all the comics I had from when I was a kid. My mother was one of those rare people who didn't throw mine out. She was a terrific lady. Yeah, mine threw my, my, my brothers and, and, and my comics were long they, gone. They, they, gone, all, they gone. always gone. did that. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the great sad things. Now, of course, everybody talks about the cost of comics and how, and how valuable they are. Uh, my collection is worth a lot of money. There are, of course, machine guns set up at every corner. So anybody <laughs> thinking that they're going to come to my house and they're going to do my comics, I will burn them. So... And have you read each of the 250,000 books in the collection? My response to that is when somebody comes into my house, there's two kinds of people. There are people who live with books who don't think anything about it. They say, oh, you've got a lot of books. There are others who come in and say, my God, have you read all these books? And I say, no, who the hell wants a library full of books you already read? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and they, that seems like a proper answer. What, what do you read that makes, you know, we all do guilt reading. Like I used to read Jackie and Suzanne novels back in the 70s. And you, you know, just to, I uh, worked on Valley of the Dolls. I was the first writer I, on that. I, I, know, I, I know, but do you, do you read anything that uh, you feel kind of guilty? A guilty reading? pleasure? Yeah. Um, no, I look at it all as a piece. Uh, when, when my, my favorite writer, who's your favorite writer? Of all writers, who's your favorite writer? Oh, man, I think probably uh, Jim Mishner. Really? Yeah, I like Jim Mishner. Now, you see, Larry King, I was only on Larry King's show once, but I asked him that question, and he gave me the most amazing answer. Because I, I don't think, I, compa well, I don't want to get into that, but I'm not nuts about the way Larry King interviews. I understand. And, uh, and, I, and I was You know the two things I like most about Larry? His face. Well, he's got a lot of character in his face. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Don't jerk me around here, Snyder. <laughs> it's been a crappy week, Snyder. <laughs> Don't mess with me. I'm ballistic tonight. You know, one thing I really enjoy is hearing stories about Larry King. Well, I, he, I, I, he, he, he gave, it was, I, I, was, I was very impressed. You know who his favorite writer was? I have no idea. John O'Hara. Oh. Which is a nice choice. Mm -hmm. My favorite writer, for everybody watching, is a man whose books you cannot find. His name was Gerald Kirsch. K-E-R-S-H, Gerald Kirsch. He was an Englishman who wrote, who wrote in America a lot. He, he, had about, he wrote Night in the City that they made a couple of movies out of. Uh, if I could write one thousandth as well as Gerald Kirsch, I would go to my grave a happy man. Uh, he's, he's brilliant. Anybody can find one of his books in a used bookstore. Buy it. Now, let me ask you here about the controversy in uh, Wonderland, as you call your neighborhood. I got papers. I got papers. Oh, no, please. Oh, listen, ratty little papers. The neighborhood came today, and they gave me ratty little papers. I'm telling you. Look, I live on 200 acres of the most beautiful watershed land you you've do. ever seen. It's one of the last green belts in the city of Los Angeles, which has become a monstrous piece of concrete. Everywhere mm -hmm. you look, Asphalt, oddball. concrete, paper. It's horrible. Yep. This is, these are hills, and I live right facing Fossil Ridge, two million-year-old paleontological samples. Down at the bottom of the hill, down at the bottom of the hill, is this private school called the Buckley School. That's correct. Buckley School operates on what they call a conditional use permit, CUP. Mm -hmm. The CUP says they can have 750 students, uh, Checking oh, 750 students, that's it. They now have over 800. They are now about to try and expand and build into the Greenland. 
You're kidding. I'm not kidding. What and are they going to build there? What, what are they going to build? They're going to build. They, they need a. This is this is a two-year school, right? For for some kids, uh, 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 it, they're they're going to build tennis courts. Uh -huh. uh, and I had a little. I had a, a lovely little 16-year-old girl explain to me. She didn't give a much. Excuse me. She didn't much give a damn about that Greenland. That's the way you cleaned it up. Well, you know, <laughs> I keep forgetting I'm on television. I come to talk to you. It's like being in the real world. Uh, uh, she's Thank she's you. I, my my neighbors up the street from me. Nice people. They make the mistake of inviting Susan and me to come to a barbecue. Now, look, do, do I look to you like the kind of guy to No, you do not. You I'm don't. not a barbecue guy. Bar bar I'm not a barbecue guy, but they're nice people. I said, okay. Love fact, you me. seldom leave the house when the sun is out, I'm told. Or when it's down. Yeah, true. I go underground. Yeah, right. But we go up the, we go up the street because they're nice people. I know, I know. So, and, and, and I said to them, I said, this party's not going to be full of all the people I spend all week avoiding, is it? And she said, oh, no, 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 these are nice people. Well, of course. So... Let me let me let me do a break here and and, and clean. Am up. I getting hysterical? No, you're just you're you're becoming Harlan Ellison, the man that we all what know a, and love. What a sh what a shame. Uh, Harlan will be back uh, after we wash his mouth out with soap. We'll be right back after oh, this short oh, break. You and my mother and. <laughs> they don't don't start with me, Ellison. You know, you do your little books. I'll do my little TV show. Oh. Okay. Let me just show you a picture here of the view that Mr. Ellison enjoys from one of the windows of his manse uh, here in Los Angeles. See? Pristine. It's birds. on a mountaintop. It's in the middle of everything. We've got deer down there. It's one of the last areas where the animals can still Could live. Could we see it for just a little longer, please, while he talks about it? You know. it's, it's, it's gorgeous. What you're looking at is the San Fernando Valley, and that is Fossil Ridge and Oak Canyon. It's, it's all riparian vegetation. Animals live. I mean, wonderful, wonderful animals that come up, and they crop the trees, and it's a beautiful and little And so, area. like, where in that picture is the tennis court going to be? Well, down at the bottom, um, well, I, I could show you. Down, down at the bottom, you see that big building? That... Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not allowed to show this either. Okay. They, they are expanding this thing. I mean, I know what the people in America don't... There's people out in Kankakee who don't give a damn. That's correct. They must care. They must care about this because we need them to get to Michael Fewer. We got this councilman, Michael Fewer, and he's sort of on the fence. He's examining. We don't want to examine it. We want them to be stopped. They got this school, and it is 96,000 square feet uh -huh. in the green belt. They've got a conditional use permit they've had since the 40s or 50s for this nice little school. Now they want to expand it to 167,000. How, how many other people in your neighborhood in Wonderland, as we call it, are, you worry about this? Uh, uh, join you in this crusade? Well, uh, what about the 16-year-old that didn't uh, that, that didn't give a crap? Well, she's not from our neighborhood. She's one of the students down there. She was invited to this party. She and her parents were invited to the party. So I'm sitting there, stuffing my face with a cheeseburger, which my wife allowed me to have that one night. And, and, and she says, I go to the Buckley School. And I'm imitating it. She doesn't sound like that. But, but she's a typical 16-year-old kid, very nice little kid. Mm -hmm. She says, I go to the Buckley School. I said, yeah, we're about to have a war with you guys because we don't want you to expand. She says, well, we're going to win. And her father, her father says, yeah, we're going to win. And I thought to myself, you're going to win, sucker. You're not going to win anything because you're a dead man. I'm going to kill you and your wife and your kid right here now. Anyhow, I dragged her down the street to my house with her father chasing along behind. God forbid I should rape the little kid, right? And I left the door open. He comes running in. And I opened the, and I show her. I said, look at this land. This land Edgar Rice Burroughs had parties on. You know, had, had picnics. And she said, who was he? She said, Edgar Rice. I said, you never heard the name Edgar Rice Burroughs? I said, wait a minute, Tarzan. The name Tarzan. She said, didn't he write a poem? I said, yeah, he wrote a poem. I thought, this kid really needs a school down there. She doesn't need a tennis court. She wasn't learning too much in the school. No, the Buckley School is not teaching them much. And she needs, uh, she needs this performing arts center. She needs her tennis well, court. Well, if anybody on our I staff... I beg people, please, please write to Michael Fewer, Councilman Michael Fewer in Los Angeles. Even if you live in Alberta, Canada, write to Michael Fewer. Tell him... Please, not to let the Buckley School expand. Please, I've never asked you for anything else. Anybody on this show who wished to send their child to the Buckley School, out of the question. Here's Kyle on the toll-free in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Hello. Yes, uh, hello, Mr. Allison. Let me ask you something in Ypsilanti. Are you going to be calling up the office of Councilman Michael Fuhr in Los Angeles? Get off of it. And saying, don't let that school expand? Get Are off, you? Get off of it. Go ahead, Kyle. If you give me his phone number, no, I we don't have No, his, I'm not going to give you his we're, damn we're, phone number. Look it up. I understand that uh, several years, several decades ago, you ran with a gang in Brooklyn. Yeah, way what, back when. What was your most intense experience during your hands-on research? Somebody tried to knife me to death. I got a, uh, I got a bailing hook scar here, which if I hadn't, if I hadn't been wearing a leather jacket, would have ripped off my arm. Uh, it was, um, it was high intensity. I, uh, this was, this was one of the great stupid things I did in my life. Uh, I had, I had absorbed Hemingway's admonition that you should never write about what you don't know. So I get to New York, and I said, uh, yeah, there, there was a writer at the time named Hal Elson. 
Hal Elson. He was writing juvenile delinquency novels, and I liked them a lot. So I said, well, I'll join a gang, and I'll, I'll write this novel. So I went over to Red Hook in Brooklyn, and I joined a gang, and I ran with them for about 10 weeks, and almost got myself killed. But uh, Rough crowd, though, huh? Oh, very mean, yeah. very mean, very yeah. mean. A lot meaner now. A lot meaner now. Nobody had Glocks in those days. They had zip guns. They had switchblades, grav shake knives. But uh, you can get killed just as easily with a grav shake knife than you can, uh, you yes, know, you with, can. A, with a Glock. Yes, you can. Yes. yes. You can. But the project produced two books. Four books. Four. Four books. Two books of short stories: The Juvies, and uh, which was originally called Children of the Streets, and The Deadly Streets, a novel which is called Web of the City, and the biography which is called Memos from Purgatory. Mm -hmm. Very good. Kyle, I'm glad you called, and thank you for watching tonight. Yeah, I'd, li I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Allison for uh, his years of hard work and uh, appreciate the enlightenment that he's brought to us, uh, to, his, to his readers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I and the Buddha have done our very best. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle, and, th and, and have a good weekend, okay? Yeah, good night. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Somebody emailed me to ask you about Babylon 5. Yeah. What, was your, what, what, what is your fondest memory of that, and what do you feel was the best thing you contributed to Babylon 5, as I recall the email? Well, Babylon 5, as everybody knows, is the dance that is, that is done by Joe Straczynski, J. Michael Straczynski, who created it, and has done, he did an amazing thing. He created, in five years, he plotted a five-year arc, and he literally created War and Peace in space. And he, and he had complete control over the show, and it's been an amazing success. I was permitted to work on the show with Joe as a, as a conceptual. And has very loyal viewers. Oh, and, and, and with cause. Right. With cause. There's a big difference, it, it seems to me, between the people who are big Babylon 5 fans and those who are fans of a lot of other shows, which I will not name. They're not fanatic as much as they are really loving. Uh, they know that they had something wonderful there, and after five years it's now done, and Joe is going on to do a new series called Crusade. Mm -hmm. And um, my fondest memories are busting Joe's chops and making him crazy. Uh, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the kind of... Th people say to me, what, what did you do on the show as conceptual consultant? Here's, here's, here's the kind of thing I did. Joe would send over a, uh, uh, a director's cut, and he would say, take a look at this. Just tell me what you think uh, before it went on the air. And, I, and, I, and I'm looking at this one, and I, and I looked at it, and something bothered me. I couldn't figure out what it was. Something bothered me. I ran it again. Still couldn't figure out. Again and again. I, I, I ran it three times. Finally, I figured out what it was. In a scene in the biosphere, which is the enclosed right. garden, big right. garden, supposed to be 50 miles or something like that, the, the two principal characters are talking to each other. And as they're standing and talking, not one leaf is moving. And, some, and I had an epiphany. And what it was, was I had seen on PBS, which we all hate because they all jerk us around, uh, they had done a show on the biosphere too. And they found that bamboo was dying. And they were giving it plenty of nutrients. It was getting water and sunlight and everything, yeah. but, but it was dying. And they finally figured out that the reason it was dying is that there was no wind to make oh. it move. And bamboo must move, move. for the, for the and xylem and phloem. you saw the thing and it wasn't... And, and so, I'm, so I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm looking at two people standing on a set. And I called Joe and I said, Joe, it's phony. It's a set. There's no crickets, there's no bugs, there's not the sound of the breeze, no leaves are moving. Two people are standing in front of rubber plants on a set. Yeah. And he said... My gosh, you're right. And he went, and he and John Copeland looked at it, and they said, we're going to have to do something. So they rented big wind machines so they could make the leaves move, and they had to reshoot every single scene because it made too much noise, and I cost them thousands of dollars. And, and that, that was, made, and made you deliriously happy. And that was, no, they never <laughs> were able to use it again, but that's, that's what I did. Okay. We will continue with Harlan Ellison after these messages. When you go on book tours, and I know you do this, what do you like better for interviews? Print interviews for papers and magazines or broadcast? Broadcast. Why? Because most of the people who do interviews, these any, any schmendrick in the world thinks they can do an interview. Interviewing is, is as tough as what you do well. Most people don't do what you do very well. I've been interviewed by thousands of people all over the country and they just they are dubs they don't know how to do it mm -hmm. they don't know how to ask the questions they don't yeah. know where the where to go into the question and when you give interviews you find that you're dealing with people who are basically semi-illiterate really they, yeah they 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 don't know how to spell they use spell checkers uh, they put all their stock and faith in uh, uh, in in computers and, and 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 that kind of thing they use cliches they, or, there are two kinds they're the people who are complete dummies and don't know who you are and expect you to explain everything to them, and then they get it all wrong. And when you say, look, I'd like to, I'd like to vet the copy, I'd like to see it, just to catch errors of, of fact, they say, oh, no, you can't no, see no, it. Can't see no, I'm, I'm a journalist. No, you're not a journalist, Schmendrick. You're an imbecile. You're a pinata. You ought to have a big stick to knock the crap out of you. Uh, uh, and, 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 and they won't let you do that. The others are... It is truly you against the world, isn't it? 
I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. I don't like it much. <laughs> Oh, you love it, Harvey. No, I do. Oh, you do. What, what make, why would you say that? Because you, you get a smile on your face every time you talk about beating the crap out of somebody. Do I? Yeah, you do. That's not good. That's bad character. Can I ask you a question? I've always wanted to ask you. Yeah, well, You're a Jewish kid, right? I'm Jewish, yeah. What do you think of Christianity? You ever think of Truth? It? Yeah. Real truth? Yeah. I think it's mean-spirited. Really? Yeah. I think it... Uh, I don't like... But I don't like Judaism either for the same reason. The only religion, religion I think has any... Has any any real reason to exist is Buddhism. All the other religions tell you God is a mean, ugly, stupid, demented loony who will, who will kill you if you masturbate. Uh, I, I, Mark Twain... Well, we both should have been dead for years. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or, or had, you know, have a catcher's mitt growing out of our hands. <laughs> I, on the Merv Griffin show... I got one minute. It's all yours. Go. Merv Griffin show, years ago, he, interview, he was interviewing me. He was trying to, trying to, ask, to make me talk about astrology. I said, astrology is crap it's idiots any idiot, anybody who believes it's an imbecile uh, I, I said uh, uh, he said do you believe in god well he's got an audience that is composed of men with red necks and women with blue hair and and uh, and i said well i go with what mark twain said mark twain said if you really believe that there is some bearded deity up there watching you all the time and you look around the condition of the world you are forced to the ineluctable conclusion that god is a malign thug and, and the audience went absolutely bananas and wanted to kill They had to sneak me out the back door. They were going to kill you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like religions. I think, I think when religion is good, when it is kind, when it is nice, when it is decent to people, when it is the golden rule, fine. I don't like it when it bombs abortion clinics in the name of God. I don't like it when, uh, when, when, when people pass bookstores and say, take that out because God doesn't want that book. And how the hell do you know what God wants? God doesn't come over to your house and have bagels and locks on Sunday. You don't go bowling with God. They're all imbeciles. They're talking. They talk to God, and God answers them. People were put away in, in, in lunatic asylums for this kind of crap. But no, there they are on television, night and day, talking about God's word like they get it. Well, you asked me, and I told you. Yes, you did. You always have. See you next time, kid. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. All right. Harlan Ellison, the guest. We'll be right back to tell you about Monday after these oh, messages. Oh, God, I didn't talk about as the smoke clears from Still Another Appearance by Harlan Ellison, I thank you all for watching. I hope you come back Monday for Peter Funt and some great clips from Candid Camera here on CBS. Please enjoy your Father's Day and join me in waiting for collect calls from our children. Uh, if, ignor <laughs> <laughs> if ignorance is bliss, a lot of people are walking around in orgasm. Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs>